understand that there are exceptions to HIPAA. So we've got to be careful about putting things in silos where one uh, provider is not talking to another provider and everybody's holding their cards close to their chest. I serve on the domestic violence death review team and I see what happens when providers aren't talking to one another. So we're here today, I bet we have people, do we have people from the domestic violence agencies in the, in the house? Yeah? Uh, do we have people in law enforcement in the house? No? Uh, do we have people in social services? Uh, who am I missing? Where are you from? Free trial services. Free trial services. Awesome. Law enforcement. Yay. Awesome. Anybody else I haven't covered? Mental health? Like we did mental health? Anybody else? Medical Pardon? social workers. Medical social workers. Medical social worker. And we've got where was Stanford Medicine was in the house in a little while. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm glad to see. Look at this collaborative body that we have here. Imagine if each one of you had come into contact with uh, Jack Jones, uh, who was a personal concern for each one of you, could we all put uh, our heads together and see how we can intervene in a way that can help him uh, avoid becoming the next mass shooter. So what Casey says, and you're going to see from what I'm about to say, even if I don't get through all the slides today, I'll do my level best, but you've got them online. So um, please, I encourage you to, if I miss any, go too fast or don't get to everything, please uh, take it home for some um, bedside reading tonight. Uh, to fill in the gaps, but you'll see in the rest of my presentation is going to reflect closely what I've just summarized in the two days strangulation uh, training that I went to. All of these things uh, will be reflected in what we're talking about with mass shootings in public spaces. The findings of the Secret Service report they end by talking about how it's not it's early intervention and when they're adults a collaborative approach. That's the two pronged book ended approach to dealing with this issue. So we want to catch them at the top of the cliff when they're young boys growing up in a troubled home, <coughs> early intervention, and then when they become a personal concern, we want everybody talking to one another, all the providers talking to one another and seeing uh, how they can intervene before the worst thing happens. Could you ever imagine going to the Gilroy Garlic Festival and having to wear a bulletproof vest or looking around to see where the nearest exit is, like, where you can be safe? Could you ever imagine that five, ten, one year ago? Earlier this year, could you ever imagine that sort of thing happening? It's a different world, folks, from what we grew up with. Who would ever imagine that kindergarten could be a place to be concerned about? A movie theater, and we'll talk more about the, one of the latest movies that come out. A Walmart, you know, a music festival, a hotel, a nightclub. Mm -hmm. All of these places now, you got to be kind of looking over your shoulder, and it's so much easier to just kind of but we lapse into denial, it'll never happen here, it'll never happen here, until it does. We're not innocent anymore. We used to think, well, this isn't going to happen in California, and then, Gilmore Garland has And he cut through the fence. In El Paso, in the manifesto that the uh, El Paso shooter wrote, he said, here's his advice to other shooters, go for the innocent places where civilians aren't, uh, aren't suspecting anything. That's where you will maximize your casualty rate. So now on to talking about mass shootings. Uh, people define mass shootings in different ways. Uh, they use different uh, different numbers. The gun violence archive, it's four or more shot and or killed, not including the shooter. The FBI doesn't have any uh, clear definition of mass shooting. They talk about mass killing as four or more people shot or killed in a, well, should be shot and killed, right? Because it's mass killing. Uh, Secret Service, the, the reporting we're talking about, three or more persons harmed. Every time for gun safety, safety, four or more people shot and killed on the shooter. So kind of the definitions are kind of all over the place, but basically um, more than two people um, are being impacted by it. Overall, overall, the good news is violence overall is going down in our, uh, in our country, but mass shootings going up tripled oh, since 2011. Still a relatively rare event, relatively rare, but getting more and more common. But, um, depending on how you measure it. Uh, let's look at some more bad news here. Over 50%, according to uh, Every Time for Gun Safety, that keeps uh, uh, data on um, mass shootings. Over half of the cases, the perpetrator had a, a record of uh, domestic violence. And here, um, this was reported, summarized by Steve, uh, Steve Barron, who's very active in the domestic violence field. 
So for this year, up until today, there have been 324 mass shootings. This is um, according to every town for gun safety. So it's not just public spaces, but um, mass shootings uh, all over the country. So it's like um, at least one every day, and actually more than one a day. So the Secret Service report, the summary that came out in July of uh, July of this year for the mass shootings that happened in 2018. So comparing 2017 to 2018, so they're saying 28 incidents in 2017, uh, 27 this year, 147 killed in 2017, 91 killed uh, uh, in 2018. And for 2018, here's where the shootings tended to take place around um, the outskirts. Of our, of our country as opposed to in the, mid, in the middle. Here's where they tend to take place. Uh, places of business saw the most mass shootings. Open spaces, parking lots, parks, some in schools, one in the house of worship. And in almost every case, it's a male who is perpetrating the violence. Every single case in 2017, it was uh, in almost every case in uh, 2018. Here's Casey Gwynn's summary of the Secret Service report. There were significant stressors in the past five years. Aggressive narcissism in the perpetrator. He had issued concerning communications. He let it slip some way or another in a way that caused other people concern before it happened. Remember the Parkland shooting? Uh, uh, nobody was surprised afterwards. They had pegged him as a, a mass shooter way before it happened. They tend to have grievances. There's something that has pissed them off, either in their own uh, intimate partner relationships, something in their personal life, uh, or uh, at work. They tend to get obsessed with a certain idea, person, or uh, harm done to them. And they tend to have beliefs um, that uh, are often, uh, often have some kind of violent uh, root to them. It could be like white male supremacy, uh, it could be the incel movement. Are you all, can you put your hands up if you're familiar with the incel movement? Mm -hmm. Okay, oh, all right, great. So I've got, uh, uh, got some new things to share with you then. Let me just share with you this, just this example of this uh, young man, Woven Fire, inside a yoga studio, talking about places that we used to, you wouldn't think twice about going to a yoga studio, like you're going there to chill out and to reach a sense of calm and to relax and now here this, these are people being gunned down. But the young man that did it from adolescence, others had expressed concerns about his behavior around women and girls. He had a certain attitude. Would you like to have a seat? Sure. Uh, relax. Now look at the typical characteristics of mass shooters and then let's compare them to the, in, uh, the, the incels. I'm going to de define that in a moment. But, um, tend to be males, they typically have a grievance, so they've got an axe to grind, a uh, grudge. Uh, they feel like, oh, poor me, poor me, the harm, wrong has been done to them. And they sympathize, sympathize with others who feel similarly aggrieved. They don't really care much about their life, and uh, they often end up dying by suicide, suicide by cop. Um, they take a long time to prepare for their attack. It's not like they snap. Uh, there's a lot of planning and effort that goes into it. They, there's often something, a phenomenon called leakage, where they're sharing your plans with, uh, with other people, but typically not with the victim that they're intending to kill. All these characteristics, they tend to um, uh, be held in common with um, incels. This was a term that was adopted back in the 90s uh, by an on group uh, online. I've heard one other story was uh, that a, a young woman had first used it, but. Uh, typically, it's uh, an online group of their heterosexual men that haven't been able to really hook up in a meaningful way with a woman, and they feel it's the woman's fault, and the women are discriminating against them, uh, and it's their right uh, to have sex, and that women are depriving them of the basic God-given right to have sex. And um, it's basically a very misogynist kind of movement, and it has things in common with other types of racism to the point where they think that women who are denying them sex are committing a crime and they must be held accountable for uh, committing that crime. And they get on, they used to get on forums like Reddit, you know about Reddit, uh, uh, to uh, complain about uh, how horribly they were being treated by women. 
And when, when they were bumped off Reddit, they went to 4chan and 8chan. Uh, and, and the reason why they were bumped off Reddit was because they were talking about um, seeking revenge in violent ways. So here's Elliot Roger, who called himself an incel, an involuntary celibate. So he's not able to have sex, not because he doesn't want to, but, but because he can't get a girl, can't get a girlfriend. And he has become somewhat of a patron saint uh, in the uh, incel movement. They call him Saint El uh, Elliot, or sometimes the Supreme Gentleman. <coughs> they praise his attack where he went down to Isla, Isla Vista and uh, shot all those young college students. And when, they, when, uh, when other um, uh, potential mass shooters are talking about committing some kind of copycat act, they, call, they talk about it, they, they, the, the phrase he uses, going ER, ER for Elliot Roger. Another hero to the incels, James Holmes. You remember James Holmes? Mm -hmm. About going to a movie theater, watching The Dark Knight, and what happened to in Aurora in the Aurora movie theater? With all those people that got killed innocently attending that uh, screening of a Batman movie. So there we have Elliot Roger on the left, with somebody posting this. Um, this post here saying the hero we all need. This is, you know, an incel praising him. And then uh, another one of the heroes in the incel movement, James Holmes on the right. Elliot Rogers beliefs. Here's what they included. Women should not have the right to choose who to mate and breed with. Women have more power in human society than they deserve, all because of sex. There's no creature more evil and depraved than the human woman. The second phase, he has a, this phase of uh, this plan of revenge. The first, uh, the second phase is going to represent war, his war on women. I will punish all females for the crime of depriving me of sex. I cannot kill every single female on earth, but I can deliver a devastating blow that will shake all of them to the core of their wicked hearts. Put that out on the internet. Then we get other lonely incels gathering together and sharing Elliot Rogers' belief. And many of them have spun off and become members of the manosphere. Have you heard any of these terms? Manosphere, MGTOW, Supreme Gentleman, the Red Pill, Hypergamy, Chads and Stacey, Sportchan, HN. Have you heard any of these terms? Hands up if you've heard them all. Awesome, Micah, go to the head of the class. <laughs> Just because we went to the ATAP conference together, and I'm going to talk about ATAP in a little bit. But um, The manosphere is sort of the broad umbrella that covers this misogynist movement. Um, ladies in the, in the room and wonderful gentlemen who have joined us, there is a movement on the rise that women have to be aware of, and gentlemen, I hope you will protect us from, as we protect one another from. And that is the rise of misogynist men who are about taking their power back from women who they think have stolen it from them. The truth is, did you ever see The Matrix, where there's a choice halfway through the movie, are you gonna take the blue pill and just go on and live this life of, uh, uh, fantasy where you uh, drink the Kool-Aid and just think this is uh, reality. You're going to take the red pill and wake up to the truth of what's happening to you and the impression that you're suffering. So that gave birth to the red pill movement being applied to the incel movement where you, the truth is men are truly the oppressed ones, not women. Men, let's take our power back and let's really talk about uh, uh, women and what they're trying to do to men, trying to take their jobs away. They're uh, trying to emasculate them. Um, thinking about a certain group of women who are highly attractive and uh, are going after the men who are at the top of the pecking order when it comes to uh, desirable qualities. Uh, so these guys tend to be well employed, they're successful, professional, educated, intelligent, handsome, buff, um, popular. 20%, and then they, what are the other 80% of men? Sort of the, the leftovers that this type of woman is going to just sort of bide her time with, that women in general will bide her time with until they can trade up uh, for somebody that's more sophisticated, more powerful, has more money. So that's called hypergamy, when you're trading up in the social ladder to go from so a, just a regular average Joe to somebody that's got all these characteristics that you really want. 
So the, in, the uh, incel movement, the manosphere, the men going their own way, you're saying we've had it with this, uh, women using men, let's, and some of them will say let's use women and get our satisfaction from them um, before they can take it from us. <coughs> so it's a very cynical, misogynist way of looking at women and um, uh, we talked about uh, Elliot Roger being referred to as the supreme uh, gentleman. And this sort of the, um, we have the upper echelon of men, we have the upper echelon of women who are highly attractive and very popular and very successful, and they're, go they're called the Stacys. And the Stacys are going after the Chads, and the incel movement particularly hates the Stacys. They want the Stacys, but they can't have them because they know that the Stacys are ultimately in search of the, uh, of the Chads. So there's this huge, like this, um, this um, fermenting uh, anger, seething rage um, uh, boiling up inside them. Uh, as they're comparing the average average looking woman to the one that uh, the one that every man wants uh, and then there's this whole charm school uh, how, how to you know how to seduce a woman how to get her into your corner and then make her do the things you want and submit to you and here's the chads in the world here who are buff and walk a certain way in the hair never loses you know its wave even in the wind um, very stereotypical, almost cartoonish way of looking at the world and uh, people, but there's a whole movement of men out there that are drinking this Kool-Aid and trying to spread it. Uh, here's one that drank it. Uh, and you all remember that attack that happened back in Toronto? Uh, you know anything in the hands of a perpetrator can become a weapon, right? Even a car turns his van. Uh, into this missile that uh, plowed through a bunch of women, predominantly women, 10 dead, 14 wounded. He belonged to the incels. And here's what he wrote. Private, recruit, he had belonged to the military for a little bit. Manassian Infantry, triple O tens, wishing to speak to Sergeant Fortchan, remember? Talked about that online forum, please, and gave his number. The incel rebellion has already begun. We will overthrow all the Chads and Stacys. All hail the Supreme Gentleman, Elliot Roger. All makes sense now, right? Now that you have the context. How chilling. And here's Holmes, the Aurora, Colorado uh, shooter. Um, has anybody seen the new movie that came out, The Joker? What did you think of the movie? Scary. Scary. Uh, the concern was it was going to kind of glorify uh, and excuse uh, the behavior of a young man who'd been marginalized by society and by women and um, ended up taking revenge on the world by committing a mass shooting. But the idea was to kind of, the, the concern was making people empathize with someone like that who was so evil. Do you think that the movie succeed at all in, in doing that? Not just I'm not asking you in particular, but do you think do you agree with that looking like it that was the intent? Yeah, they did um, make you empathize with him because they led into his childhood and like the things he went through as a child that kind of made him into that person. So What's your name? Marisha. Marisha, what you're getting at here is the A scores right here, right? A rage filled boy becomes a rage filled man. And marginalized, isolated. He's a, a powder keg. Before that movie came out, uh, the uh, uh, military issued a memo to its staff. Posts on social media have made reference to involuntary celibate incel extremists replicating the 2012 theater shooting in Aurora, Colorado at screenings of the Joker movie at nationwide theaters. This presents a potential risk to DOD, Department of Defense personnel, and family members, and the average citizen. Incels are individuals who express frustration for perceived disadvantages to starting intimate relationships. Incel extremists idolize violent individuals like the Aurora movie theater shooter. They also idolize the Joker character, the violent clown from the Batman series, admiring his depiction as a man who must pretend to be happy but eventually fights back against his bullies. 
When entering theaters, identify two escape routes, remain aware of your surroundings, and remember the phrase, run, hide, fight. Run if you can. If you're stuck, hide, also referred to as sheltering in place, and stay quiet. If a shooter finds you, fight with whatever you can. Didn't used to think about that going to a movie theater. I don't know, maybe some of us want to stay home and wait for it to come out on Netflix. Yeah, it's a word. So, history of domestic violence and mass shootings in 2018, according to the Secret Service report, 30%, according to Casey Gwynn, that's way, way low, way, way low, because they're not given sufficient training to recognize it. Um, here's an example quoted from the uh, Secret Service report. Um, one shooter, what he did was he assaulted, he had assaulted and threatened to kill his wife because she wanted a divorce. A month before that, a month before he was, uh, uh, he was arrested after he threatened to kill his wife and choked her with a belt. The judge agreed to issue a protective order, but denied the wife's request that her husband be ordered to relinquish his firearms. You know, not have, that didn't happen in California, right? Because that would be automatic. So here's what I said. That, um, uh, according to Casey Gwynn, for those of you who came in uh, after I said this initially, Casey Gwynn was a, a district attorney in San Diego. He, uh, he was at the forefront of creating the first family justice center in San Diego. He leads um, a, 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 a training institute on strangulation, and they do trainings all around the country, including for uh, the FBI and Secret Service uh, and physicians and all kinds of providers that interface with domestic violence victims. He worries about the feds minimizing um, uh, domestic violence, calling it a domestic disturbance. And here he says, nine out of ten of the deadliest mass shootings in modern America were per perpetrated by men with histories of violence against women, threatened violence against women, or disparaging conduct towards women. Nine out of ten. And look, all nine of the killers had high ice, uh, sorry, ACE scores. So, and he says, these are, this is all from Casey Gwynn, the majority of all mass shootings are committed by childhood trauma survivors and occur in the context of domestic violence situations. Let's look down here to the second last one. It's not an excuse, but it's an explanation and a cry for early intervention, support, and monitoring. Let's catch them early when they're rage-filled boys before they become rage-filled men who can go out and buy weapons. Majority, majority, according to Casey Gwynn, the majority of all police officers are killed by men with a history of childhood trauma, adult domestic violence in 80% of the cases, including strangulation. Oh, and it has just come out that the Las Vegas shooter had an ACE score of seven. So meet them at the top of the cliff, as well as at the bottom, right? Meet them up there with our multidisciplinary approach as a grown-up, but also, sorry, up there is the, <laughs> when they're kids, right, before they jump, and let's meet them at the bottom, too, after they've taken that leap and gone down that dark path with the multidisciplinary collaborative approach. How much better it is to catch them early on. Please, folks, have a seat, so you're not take a load off if you like. We've got plenty of seats up here in play. So every town for gun safety, are you familiar with that uh, organization? They keep a record of the mass shootings. They're, according to their estimates, over 50% uh, of the mass shootings um, uh, involve history of domestic violence. So uh, misogyny as it relates to mass shootings. Elliot Roger, one of his quotes, I don't know why you girls aren't attracted to me, but I will punish you for it. He declared war on women. Uh, the Oregon shooter, 2015, complained of being a virgin, no girlfriend. Santa Fe shooter, had made uh, advances on a female student, and she had ridiculed him uh, in class uh, the week prior, just before he committed that shooting. We talked about um, Manassian who um, mowed down all those people in Toronto, enraged that women wouldn't sleep with them. The Dayton, Ohio shooter, he had been suspended, you all read about that, right? For compiling a hit list, women that he wanted to rape and kill. And Casey just told me yesterday the Dayton shooter, shooter had a history of strangulation. So even, even where we're not 
overtly talking about disdainful women in mass shootings, there's often still, if you look, uh, uh, look closer, you'll find a history of domestic violence, sexual violence from the killer. So what does uh, the NRA, NRA do about this uh, when there's a bill on the floor, the uh, Violence Against Women, women Act here? Um, didn't sign it because, well, the fact that Nancy Pelosi is what the spokesman for the NRA said. The fact that Nancy Pelosi and her minions of anti-gun zealots insist on adding a gun control poison pill to an otherwise good bill is just another example of the shameful politics Americans hate. Such a uh, you know, language. Even though intimate partner homicides have been suddenly on the rise. Look at all the people who were killed. Most of them dropped to death. Most of them women. Here's a spokesman for a domestic violence agency called Safe uh, Horizon. For so long, we've seen domestic violence as a personal issue, right? We close the drapes, we, don't, we look away, we don't talk about it. But now, we can't ignore it. When we're seeing it move from the home out into public spaces, movie theaters, kindergartens, yoga studios, they're not just personal issues anymore, they're community issues, and they concern all of us. If we can help that person, deal with those issues earlier and earlier on. We're not just saving that person and his partner, we're also potentially saving her colleagues, workplace uh, folks, other people in the community, in the neighborhood, and strangers, people she doesn't even know. So you have the potential to save so many people. And this thing about uh, domestic violence, it's one form of oppression, right? The power of a man Oh, it's typically gender-based, right? 85 to 95 percent of domestic violence victims are female, right? And even the remaining 15 percent, most of them are, are uh, um, victims of uh, male partners. So that oppression of when we think about relationships as kind of a teeter-totter in, in a healthy relationship, that seesaw is kind of balanced, right? And in oppression theory, talks about one group of people wanting to dominate another group of people, have power over them, so they must always come out on top. Misogyny is one form. Domestic violence is up close and personal, but that whole white nationalism, white male supremacy kind of thing, racism of any kind, that's all about one group of people wanting to dominate another, often through violence. It's all about violence. What do perpetrators often have in common? So when they go to these places, sometimes they're hunting for a particular person, and they find that person and get them, and then they want to maximize the body count. Sometimes they're pissed off at the place, and they don't care who they get, they just want to shoot up the place. So it can be a combination of um, uh, either targeting either one person, or indiscriminately, or a combination. Usually there's been some kind of stress or significant stressor within uh, the last five years and particularly within the last year before they strike. And it could be any one of these. They've had criminal charges filed against them or uh, love gone wrong, somebody close to them died, they got divorced, uh, something happened at work, uh, financial issues, and they started to talk about what they want to do in threatening kinds of ways. They're stirring the pot now and other people are noticing. And in intimate partner relationships, they typically don't threaten their partner directly. There could be leakage through other means where they're talking about their plans or uh, letting it know, be known in other ways. But the closer the relationship, the more seriously you should take the threat. That's called um, the intimacy effect. Here's some uh, examples of some of the concerning uh, behaviors. Posting things, alarming things online. I just got a gun. Uh, when I grew up, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, I want to be a mass shooter. Wasn't that the parkland shooter? It was, yeah. Uh, escalating anger, aggressive behavior. Uh, one, of, one of the shooters, he started shooting uh, rats up in his backyard. The neighbors were very distressed by it. Talking about suicide, if you can hold your, uh, don't forget what you're going to say, but because I'm on a roll, <laughs> I'll come back to you with um, uh, whatever I'm going to do. Uh, writing about violence, right? um, written communications, more and more writing, more and more aggressive behavior, or cutting off communications, or going silent, showing inappropriate behavior be, uh, towards women, stalking, getting more depressed, sometimes talking about suicide, 
more drug use. Though before they commit the act, they typically t stop all drugs. They want to be really clear and focused when they go in and, uh, and do their work. Crazy kind of behavior that's disturbing to others. Buying weapons. Um, threats of domestic violence and acting paranoid. And they cause, these kinds of things were sufficiently disturbing that the other people uh, were um, very concerned about the behavior. And what did they do that showed their concern? Some of them, they were, uh, there was an intimate partner, filed for divorce, stopped talking to the person, got a restraining order. They asked other people to stay with them because they were afraid. They changed their routines, the safety planning that we do. They warned their own family and friends about their worries. They shared photos of their attacker to watch out for this guy. Who was concerned? Basically, everybody who knew them. Think back to the Parkland shooter. Everybody was concerned about that guy. When did he commit the act? Valentine's Day. And what happened to him as a child? He was thinking about going back to early childhood trauma. Adopted, and then his adopted mother died, and then he was then he was living with friends. Rejected, rejected, rejected. Rejected by his girlfriend. Rejected. Isolated. Nothing really to live for. Bitter, angry, rage-filled man. Young man. It took years. Mass shooters are years in the making. They don't just snap. And that is where the hope lies in that moment because it's a pathway to violence. It's not an immediate decision. So we can see warning signs, sometimes years before the actual attack. These shooters, these other places, they had uh, been cruel to women long before they went on a gun rampage. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm, on some level or other, if we're dealing with domestic violence victims who are facing <coughs> a life-threatening situation, we are all threat assessment professionals. And the more training we get on recognizing early warning signs and what to do about them, the better we will be at our jobs of, uh, uh, of protecting uh, the clients we serve. Here are things we can look for. History of violence, are they starting to buy weapons? Uh, are they showing signs of uh, some kind of violent intent? So if we can identify early warning signs, make sense of what they mean, it puts us in a better position to manage the risk. And we can do that best by talking to one another, by having a collaborative group where law enforcement and security and behavioral health and human resources and uh, other uh, CPS, if everybody's all talking to one another, then we can, and if we all get educated on the pathway to violence, anybody seen the pathway to violence, that paradigm? Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm so glad. Uh, I've got more news to share with you. Um, if we can learn about the pathway to violence, we can't necessarily predict someone's behavior based on their characteristics, other than the fact that mass shooters tend to be men. But they come from all over the place. And many of them are like young men, um, but uh, that uh, Las Vegas shooter was in his 60s. So uh, the things we can look for are behaviors. And if we can uh, identify these troublesome, troubling, uh, warning behaviors, then we can find ways to intervene uh, that can um, keep people safer. So here's what the pathway to violence looks like. Uh, it starts with a grievance. They feel that there's been an injustice done to them. Okay, let's take a domestic violence situation. She, my woman left me. Um, she got a restraining order against me. That sucks. I don't deserve that. I'm the victim here. Well, clearly the law has turned against me because the law screwed up enough that uh, they uh, filed this, uh, they got this restraining order against me. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. And that's when he starts to think about what, how he can get his revenge now that uh, the law has let him down. So that's when he may start to go online and start to do some research about, hmm, what could I use? I think I'm going to use a weapon, a gun. What will be the best gun to use? Semi-automatic, revolver? James Holmes did all this research before he hit the Aurora um, movie theater. Um, then um, um, he could start going to her place of employment, for example, looking for where are her points of vulnerability? Ah, and what's the security like at, this, uh, at where she works? Is it lax or uh, like, where can I slip through? He might even try to show up there sometimes, see if he can sneak through security. That's where he's getting into probing and breaching uh, the boundaries until he finally mounts the attack. Um, there could be intervention at any point along this path. And uh, along with that, as he moves along that path, he tends to get more fixated on revenge. Um, 
if it's a if it's a violent ideology like being a, a I don't know an ISIS uh, recruit, uh, instead of saying um, you know I I am really interested in this uh, in their beliefs uh, in what they're trying to do, he over time he says I am I am a soldier uh, of uh, uh, of ISIS. I am drawn to this. To I am this, uh, and you might find you might find new kinds of aggression. Where I told you this guy who starts to shoot rats in the backyard before he uh, commits his mass shooting. Um, sometimes direct threats, but not always. More often, um, and not always again, but often you will see leakage where uh, he's let something slip on Facebook posts or to friends, uh, to some other party. Uh, you might see a, an energy burst where there's a lot of activity, a lot of um, target shooting, uh, practice, uh, or more shooter uh, before uh, committing the, uh, the last act. And then that last resort behavior where Elliot Roger was uh, humiliated by uh, college students uh, and um, roughed up by them uh, just before committing his mass shooting. So it's like, this is, you've left me no choice. Now I have to do this. And poof, the point of no return has been reached. Here's an example of Elliot Re uh, Roger, of his of his leakage before committing the ultimate act. He did all kinds of YouTube videos right up until uh, the, before he committed the shooting, talking about how he was going to take his revenge on women. So, what to do about this? Um, that's where threat assessment comes in. It was uh, created by the United States Secret Service to prevent assassinations originally. But now it's been adopted to, uh, to uh, address all different types of targeted violence, regardless of where the motivation comes from, from uh, school, workplace, uh, intimate partner relationships. So if we will look at um, violence pre prevention, then uh, not so worried, we're not worried so much about characteristics, as I said, but their uh, behaviors, behaviors and how to address them. So if we can come together, express our concerns about a person of interest, and then do some brainstorming, we can better address the threat. And we have time. We have the blessing of time because, because these guys typically don't snap. They give us warning. They will tell us what they're planning to do if we only have ears to listen and share what we learned with other people. Sorry, that was our commercial. That was the uh, commercial for ATAP. Uh, Mike and I belong to the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals, and every year we go down. Uh, to the conference down in Southern California, and I invite you all to uh, become members. It's a fabulous organization. It was started down at the Los, Al uh, Los Angeles Police Department to deal with uh, domestic violence and stalking threats, and expanded to include uh, any kind of threat, any kind of targeted violence, whether it be a political official, a celebrity, uh, a corporate executive, or continuing with uh, stalking and domestic violence victims, uh, and mass shootings and serial killers. So we go down there and we, um, uh, we talk to other people uh, in the same industry that uh, approach it from different angles. There's um, uh, forensic psychologists, uh, there's uh, attorneys, there's um, CIA agents, FBI, other folks in law enforcement, uh, domestic violence. I've, I don't know, I think I was the only domestic violence advocate this year, not very many. Um, so we have some therapists, uh, forensic therapists that are uh, there, but we need more and more people in this um, in this field to be going down there and uh, learning about, that's where I learned about the pathway to violence. And they have spearheaded this mission uh, and put a bill on the floor that's hopefully gonna pass uh, to uh, make threat assessment uh, teams um, available across the United States, United States that, um, so they have them be funded by the federal government to address threats on multiple levels. That's the TAX Act, Threat Assessment Prevention and Safety Act. So I hope you'll all uh, contact your local uh, senator uh, to um, advocate for that act to be passed. So the answer is upstream and downstream. A few years ago in our uh, domestic violence conference, we talked about going upstream. Uh, and today, uh, the, the focus has been primarily downstream when we're talking about threat assessment, what to do when they're already growing up, when the rage-filled boy becomes a rage-filled man. But let's talk for a moment about the rage-filled boy. So the boy growing up, and where do we get our values? What do we learn as children? And where do we learn it? We learn it at home, right? But what if we're growing up in a home watching the way dad treats mom? 
And I've heard, you know, because I run a domestic violence organization, I've heard women say, you know, um, he's been mean to me, but he's such a good dad. And I have, to, I have to argue against that and say that you can't be a good husband if you're not also a good, you can't be a good father if you can't, if you're not also a good husband. Because what you're, what you're teaching a child is the way a man treats a woman, the way a husband treats a wife, the way a father treats a mother. It's all part of that, that all part of the same piece or puzzle that um, helps a child grow up and learn how to treat a woman, whether he's a boyfriend, a husband, or a father. So if we're not getting the values at home, uh, are they happening at school? And I know we have things like cornerstone, um, safe dates, uh, but are we really talking about, like, throughout the schools, is it in the curriculum? Are all kids learning? What does a healthy relationship look like? What to do if you find yourself in an emotionally controlling relationship? I hope we're all teaching our kids what to do if your daughter's going out with a young man. Um, well, we all know, right? If he hits you on the first date, is there going to be a second? I would hope not. But what if he's just trying to tell you what to wear, what to order in a restaurant, or whether you should go back to work, quit your job, get a job, lose weight, gain weight, wear makeup, not wear makeup, over time, see these friends, don't see those friends, share my friends, but uh, not yours. Uh, like, uh, uh, if the control is incremental, insidious, and it happens over time, are we teaching our, our girls, our boys, how to recognize that? When they're first going out and, he's, and she's getting 50 texts from him in a day, oh, isn't that sweet? He really loves me. Over time, can we help her see, we look at the context, that maybe that's starting to look a little bit more like stalking. If we can move beyond physical and sexual violence. You know what happened to the Department of Justice definition of uh, domestic violence this year? Are you all aware of what happened? Can you put your hands up if you're aware of the domestic <laughs> Rachel, yeah. Awesome. Head of the class. The Department of Justice just redefined domestic violence as of February 2019 from the old definition, which used to include course of control, emotional and financial abuse, to only felonies and misdemeanors. What the heck? Yes! That's huge! And it just slipped in. Oh, we have the Me Too movement, and now we have felonies and misdemeanors? What's a woman to do if she's in an emotionally controlling relationship? She's just looking for help now to get out. Oh, wait, I've got to wait till I have broken bones and bruises for until he strangles me. And even if he strangles me with our prosecutors, with our law enforcement, if they're not getting the training, they're not going to know. Well, there may not be signs of uh, physical injury here. I could still be dead tomorrow. I could still have life-threatening injuries. I could still have thyroid issues, asthma, stroke, as a result of what he did to me one time. And he's a thousand times more likely to kill me. None of that information is publicly out there. So I hope you will all take the pledge, as I did, to spread this information. We need to do it amongst ourselves if we're not getting it from the top down. So if we're not getting it at home, we're not getting to work, school, later at work, or, oh, spiritual abuse, I worry about that too. There are some pastors, ministers, rabbis that are very good at saying if you're in a physically, physically abusive relationship, get out. But there are others that say, submit, forgive, you know, turn the other cheek. So if we're not getting it in our faith-based life, where are we getting our values about how to treat women? God forbid, pop culture. Um, Casey Gwynn talking about his Camp Hope for kids growing up in abusive homes. Asks the kids, what do you typically do? How do you spend, what do you like to do? What are your hobbies at home? And you know what even the 10 year old boys are saying? Watch porn. This doesn't help. Talk down. These are the values. Going upstream, we've got to do a better job of teaching our kids respect for women, respect for yourself, equality. What to do when you feel angry. Sandy Hook Promise, anybody familiar with Sandy Hook Promise? So this was created, a program that was created, a curriculum that you can download for free. Um, 
from uh, the parents who were survivors of the children who were murdered in kindergarten. Sandy. By a young man who had no idea what so social emotional learning looked like. If we can help children do a better job of getting in touch with their anger, with these feelings that make them want to reach out and hurt the world, if they can find other ways of being in the world other than taking it out of other people, then we'll make them safer and the people that they interact with safer as they grow up. Sandy, what promise? Um, great curriculum. So that's things to think about as they're growing up. Addressing A scores as they're growing up. Everybody knows about the A scores? Can you put your hands up if you know what the A score is? Yay, awesome, isn't that lovely? 1998 it came out, and now we're, almost everybody's aware of it. Average childhood experiences, but I'll tell you what, there were Kaiser nurses at the uh, strangulation uh, intervention training that I went to, and they hadn't heard of the A scores. So the A scores came from Kaiser and the Center for Disease Control. So, um, and Kaiser is at the forefront. I've done trainings for Kaiser too, for their physicians. And I'm hoping that we can just keep the dialogue going, just keep spreading the word. That, um, the, uh, as we can identify these early warning signs in kids, uh, we can do a much better job at uh, teaching them another path. So, rage-filled boy without intervention becomes a rage-filled man then that's when we have to involve the collaborative approach, the threat assessment teams we're talking about here, which could begin right here in this classroom with all of you, talking to one another. What field are you from? What field are you from? Let's talk. Let's get together. Let's create our village. So um, Gavin De Becker, you all know about Gavin De Becker. Uh, he was he grew up in a very trauma-filled home himself, but he took that trauma, just as Casey Quinn did, who, by the way, also grew up in a trauma-filled home. He took the ACE test and he scored four and if you score six or more it can take up to 20 years off your lifespan so that's what trauma does to the body mm -hmm. and the brain uh, so Gavin DeBecker uh, this is um, uh, sort of a handy um, uh, tool that he uses to help um, sort of identify persons of concern looking at that per from it, looking at it from that person's point of view, does he feel justified in action that he's contemplating taking? Does he see that there's no alternative to this action in order for justice to be served? Does he not care about the consequences? And does he have the ability to carry out his revenge? Yeah. Uh, the waiver. You all know about the waiver, some of you know about the waiver, workplace uh, violence assessment tool, which you can uh, order <coughs> online. That's Reed Malloy and uh, Dr. White and Dr. Malloy, who are the creators of this. The 21 questions here uh, to look at. Um, so uh, it can help inform your judgment of whether somebody uh, is, uh, is uh, at risk of committing violence. And you see number 18, it does include uh, domestic or intimate partner violence. Strategic. Uh, approaches to dealing with it, slowing down, being careful not to uh, make any sudden moves. There are huge corporations very close to here that have a workplace policy when it comes to domestic violence that consists of sending the employee home. What the hell? How is that addressing the problem? It's the Again, you know, denial. Let's let's uh, pretend it doesn't exist. Let's not. It's not our, Let's not deal with it. What they're doing? Exiling that person to the you know the environment that is causing all the issues, putting them at further risk. But also, their colleagues are not going to be happy about you know the employee being uh, uh, not showing up for work. But also, <coughs> what's it going to do to other other employees' um, willingness to come forward? and admit that they've got this issue going on in their personal life. And what is that going to do? Isn't that going to put other employees at further risk if everybody's being taught to be silent or you're going to get sent home? It's not a helpful way to deal with this problem. Uh, these are some intervention strategies here, just from not letting the person know that you're checking up on them, just doing a, a few more background checks and interviewing other people to sitting down with the person, 
uh, maybe taking some action, transferring them to another location maybe, to, to uh, invoke the law enforcement and to more severe um, forms of intervention. Uh, they warn against getting rid of the person, especially like in, uh, for college students, for example, the Virginia Tech student, they, they try to get rid of the problem by getting rid of him. And what did he do? He came back and uh, committed a mass murder. So the more eyes that are on this person, the more forms of intervention that are happening you know, without his knowledge and with his knowledge, the safer everybody else will be. Is everybody familiar with the lethality assessment? Uh, came out of the danger assessment that all law enforcement of, um, providers are supposed to be using on every domestic violence call. The ODARA, which is um, from uh, Ontario, um, and uh, another uh, major assessment uh, tool used by, by more and more commonly by the uh, police here. This is something that you can all do in the practice in your own home, um, with the mosaic method uh, created by Gavin De Becker, in their own uh, danger assessment tool. Um, so, um, Mass shootings and childhood trauma, domestic violence, and oppression is all related. So uh, this, uh, there's a book called The Quincy Solution, based on evidence-based practices. And it came from uh, interviewing people in a high, uh, inmates at a high security prison. Every single one of them had a, uh, had a background that included domestic violence and um, sexual abuse as children. They grew up in a home. They were raised to of boys who became rage-filled men. And they learned a certain attitude towards women in the course of growing up in those homes and other types of uh, other forms of oppression. So according to Quincy, the best solution here is holding the batterer accountable and invoking the communities we're talking about today. And it ultimately will be protecting the children as a result of that so that they don't grow up in the next uh, home to become perpetrators or victims themselves. We all have a role to play in it. What it involves is really consistent and strict enforcement uh, of, the, of the law for perpetrators. And if they realize they're going to get these consequences, I have many ladies whose partners have violated the restraining order multiple times without ever being held accountable. Anybody had that experience with their clients? Yeah. Yeah. What does that teach them? Like, that you can get away with a lot? So the Quincy solution involves accountability and monitoring. Strict enforcement of criminal laws and restraining orders. Practices that make it easier for victims to leave their abusers. And the end, a coordinated community response. Everybody's saying the same thing. Casey Gwynn, Quincy, even the Secret Service report. But in the, in the Quincy uh, report, following uh, those guidelines, resulted in a decrease in domestic violence murders by a half or more. So, concluding the Secret Service study. These risk factors have been going on for a while. Remember what we said, these guys don't just snap. It happens over time. But we talk about this force multiplier effect. It makes it more, these things, they get more pronounced because of something else happening. Some kind of stressor in their life. Were they fired? Did they get a divorce? Did they lose custody of the children? Did something else happen? Even that danger assessment, it's a snapshot in time. And it should be used in the context of other tools to assess danger level, which is a dynamic process. Danger fluctuates according to life circumstances. Today he had custody of the children, tomorrow he doesn't. Today he didn't have a restraining order, tomorrow he does. Ooh, today she tells him she's leaving. That um, the lethality risk goes up. Um, something else I learned, uh, prosecutors can actually prove a case of um, strangulation even without the victim present. The victim does not have to be present in order for that to happen. So that's powerful information. Um, that trajectory into violence tends to be likely. There are identifiable faces along the, along the pathway to violence, right? So we recognize, we look for those early warning signs. Does he have an axe to grind? Um, is he starting to think about it all the time? Has he been going online? Is he researching the different weapons? Has he been popping up, showing up at different pla at her workplace or uh, the gym or where she likes to hang out? Is he talking to his friends about how much he hates her and he's you know, the, uh, he's been ripped off with this restraining order. He doesn't know what else he can do to, uh, you know, uh, uh, punish her. Is he saying things like, she leaves me no choice, or, uh, you know, there's not much left in my life anyway. Is he starting to talk like he's, uh, he's on the way out? 
So if we can find out, if we can find them earlier and earlier on that pathway to violence, we will be more effective in uh, intervening. But it's not just up to the law, not just up to law enforcement to jump in and save the day, right? We need to become partners with them. Partners with all of them. This is a secret service study that's echoing just what I said about the threat, is, uh, uh, threat assessment teams. Secret service report is saying, Law enforcement should partner with the mental health community, local schools and school districts, houses of worship, social services, and other private and public community organizations. Let's all get together, all be talking to one another. We don't do that. We don't do that, and we need to do it. There are lives that can be saved by coming together. Multidisciplinary and collaborative community approach. So uh, the National Council of uh, um, Experts, um, they also agree with these uh, basic findings and they go on to say because there's a psychiatrist, a forensic psychiatrist involved in it as well. They say prioritize as high risk individuals, people with narcissistic or paranoid personality traits. People fixate that fixation again, fixated on feelings of injustice, that grievance. Are they getting isolated through social relationships and have they had recent stressors? Again, what we were talking about. And again, they say as well, coordinated community-wide response made up of all these different people that you could involve, all the providers here that we talked about. And summing up, coming up to my big finish here, now uh, we want to we, we want to address this problem head on. We want to involve everybody uh, uh, in our sphere of influence to, uh, to address it, to keep the world safer, and we also want to look after ourselves in the process. This is hard, lonely work, and we want to reach out uh, and make it as um, collaborative as we possibly can. We'll all be safer as a result, and we'll all be healthier as a result. So I want to thank you all for being threat assessment managers, and thanks uh, for doing what you can to make our world uh, a safer place. So thank you, everybody. Emmanuel. Shooting in North Carolina, or is very racially targeted. Can you just say that a little louder and a little, just a little harder to hear in here? So the shooting in North Carolina, 2017, with the uh, Emanuel Church. Yes. It was, it was racially, it was all black. So yes. The guy was sitting in there. Yes. Um, was there any information? So we talked about the ACE study, but we also know that he was part of the white supremacy. Yes, and he had a history of domestic violence, and he had cracked open the skull of uh, his child. What about, in, well, I know this was just too recently the same thing, right? Gilroy was almost bad. Yeah, okay. yes, uh, we don't have information about, and I actually asked James Given Shapiro, and he's not at liberty to disclose that yet. It's an ongoing mm -hmm. investigation, but it will be interesting. But that um, uh, the Dayton uh, shooter uh, just revealed that he had a history of strangulation. Okay. So it was, it's, sorry, it, part of my question was around when it comes to white supremacy trainings. Uh, endemic racism, not just the DV issue, but the racism as well. Is there any studies on the correlation further than or because I think it's one thing when you're training you're training people of course with DV, you're training people to deal with that whole like, kind of Yeah, know. well I guess I think I sort of alluded to it briefly earlier that these are all forms of oppression. It's a group of one group of people wanting to dominate another group of people from white male privilege white male supremacy to misogyny to other forms of racism it's all you know trains around that what do you say trainings uh, uh can you say a little bit more are there trainings or are, are there trainings and, and yeah are there right trainings? here right now doing it right now specific um, to racism it's very specific to dealing with racism cultural competency yeah uh, anybody have any thoughts about that are there trainings that help to address uh racism become more culturally competent. Racism, domestic violence, racism, I don't, I don't Around the mass shootings, I think she's trying to see if there's any trainings out there that you're aware of yeah. that are around racism and mass shootings. Yeah, I no. Other than what I just talked about today, no. And that's a, that's a gap and we need to be okay. talking about it more. That's because when you, Yeah, okay, thank you. So whenever you start to think that, to treat people as less than human, right, as objects or like possessions in so many ways that's what women in domestic violence relationships are treated as right objects possessions child but if we go back far enough in time don't we live in kind of a patriarchal world where women were property uh, until very recently uh, and some some some
sometimes people you know, have that kind of old, antiquated belief that you're my woman, you belong to me. Or that one culture's less than the other culture. Absolutely, yeah. Yes. I think we, there's a lot more conversation on that that needs to happen in relationship to. I agree. We have the macrocosm and then the microcosm where it's played out in, in the home. Yeah. Anybody else in our um, running programs for, for lack of a better word, for the offenders? Uh, there is an element where we address, uh, and it's supposed to be actually throughout the, the curriculum, that we address that, that um, notion of entitlement. Um, and whether it is based in gender or it's based in, um, in race or religion, what have you, mm -hmm. and we spend time talking about whatever you characterize a group of people as somehow inferior, including that you see different as inferior, mm -hmm. um, that that is equal to violence. And so we're trying. <laughs> we're, sure. we're trying. What was the name of that? What is so I run a batteries of intervention program. Okay, I can connect you back to you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Micah. Well, well explained. That's important work too. I'll address that because uh, as long as these things are not talked about, as long as they're invisible, that's that's how they remain dominant. Nobody's talking about it or addressing it. It remains unaddressed. Anybody else have any other thoughts, questions? Um, Comments, but any of what any anything I said? Any of it shocking? Are you all gonna go to the movies tonight and just relax and hang out? Or are you gonna look for the exits? Here are your emergency exits. It's like on an airplane. I think that's important that I mean, it's important you brought that up, but also important that we really look at how we don't let fear subdue us. Absolutely. We keep on living our lives, we be cautious and vigilant, but not paranoid. Um, I just want to take a minute to show the uh, handout uh, that is on everybody's, uh, see, did everybody get one? Yeah, yeah everybody got one. Um, just, to, uh, just summarizing the most important things, and I've added a few uh, slides that weren't in the talk, uh, but uh, um, So everybody has a sense. Maybe if you, if you can go back to your uh, places of employment and talk to your supervisor, or if you are a supervisor, talk to your staff about like how can we start a threat assessment team? Like what, what would it take to do one here in Santa Clara County? I serve on the domestic violence death review team. I see what happens when it's too late. And then we talk about Jackie Campbell's death, danger assessment and all the red flags. And they're oh well, he he failed the batteries intervention program, and the CPS was called all these times, and. He was kicked out of school, and there was a drug issue, and he wasn't working. Oh, check, 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 check. And, you know, in the end, there's no surprise. But now here we have people from, you know, different disciplines who get together after it's already too late. But can we have, well, so we can learn, hopefully, going down the road and, and, and help other people. It's of value. But could we have another team where we look at what happens before the ultimate act of domestic violence, the ultimate act of control? Of taking someone's life from them, so um, so I included the uh, pathway to violence there. I hope you can share that with your folks. I hope you'll continue this conversation when you go back to your places of employment because I thought this was really powerful to visualize, uh, to be thinking about somebody that may be of concern to you. Where is he on this path? Sometimes where is she? But most likely it's uh, see if we saw the statistics. It's mostly men. Uh, Sandy Hook Promise. I've got the. Um, the website there for you to go on uh, to look at their curriculum and maybe talk to your, if you're a mom or on the PTA committee, talk to your schools about, oh, are you incorporating any of this social emotional learning into your curriculum? That would be good. And here on these next few pages are some uh, warning signs and signals that I didn't talk about today, but that you can read at your uh, leisure, other things to be looking for in any um, persons of concern. Uh, then page seven is a summary of these uh, some of the threat assessment tools, and you can look at any of them online. Uh, easy to easy to come across. And then um, starting on uh, uh, other threat assessment tools are on page ten, uh, including the um, website for the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals, which I would encourage you all to join. Um, 
Just talk to me for Micah. Are you are you wanting to be a sponsor? Oh, yeah. Okay. We we'll need a sponsor. Are you working on school districts? Doing any work in school districts? Uh, I've talked to uh, Kahila Jewish High School. Um, and uh, Los Angeles History Museum had a uh, had uh, half a dozen schools, high school students, them to work on Juana Briones, a, a project next of it on her, because she was a, a businesswoman, uh, curandera, and a domestic violence uh, survivor. So I talked about domestic violence then and now uh, to those high school students, but I want to do more and more in the schools. So I'd love to love to be able to get into the schools because I was a teacher before. Uh, becoming a, an advocate. I feel right at home here in the classroom. Uh, the page 11, uh, resources, so that we can start to create our own little village of resources here. If you're not aware of them all, you may be, but just in case you're not aware of them all, all um, the family justice centers that are in Santa Clara County, you know we've got three here through ACI, the YWCA and Community Solutions. The headquarters is Family Justice Center down in uh, San Diego, and there's a website uh, to find them in other parts of the country. Um, then um, agencies that address domestic violence in our county and even beyond in the Bay Area, on page 11. Uh, resources out of the area, love is respect, um, Sandy Hook Promise, um, and, and a few others. So I hope that these resources will help you to uh, sort of build your own network that you can draw on as you communicate and collaborate and end up uh, Helping us all be safer. Oh, yeah, Rachel, I was just going to comment. This is um, actually very helpful. Um, so um, I'm actually a client at this organization. Um, I'm facilities and management, so I run RFPs for services like security. So this is going to now be something that is ingrained into the RFPs when we ask them what is their plan and who do they have a plan for um, domestic violence. What do they do? What is their training? Are there, are there security guards trained for this? Do they know what to look for? So this is something that I don't I don't need approval from corporate to do and I can put whatever I want in the RFPs. So this is something that will go in the RFPs moving forward and it also be um, passed on as a standard throughout um, the rest of the organization. So I, I work for a global company and when we put together standards and we put together um, RFPs to RFP the services, this is something that we can put in and say, here's the standard and here are the things that you need to start asking for. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Rachel, for that. Your good work. Um, yeah, if we can go out and start asking companies, what's your domestic violence protocol? You're going to find most companies don't even have one. So uh, there's more, always more work to be done. So uh, any other questions, comments? No? Look at that. And they said it couldn't be done. I got through all the slides. Yay. Awesome. Have a fabulous weekend, everybody.